Good evening. I'm Commissioner Keon and welcome to you for, to this community conversation on the COVID-19 vaccines. We have with us tonight, Dr. Eileen Marty and our fire chief, Chief De La Rosa. Dr. Marty is a professor of infectious diseases in the Department of Medicine at FIU. She has served in the US Navy, worked with the World Health Organization in the fight against epidemics, specializes in infectious disease pathology and disaster medicine. Chief De La Rosa heads our emergency management response as well as serving as our fire chief. They are both here with us tonight to talk with you about the vaccine and the readiness and the availability of vaccine and to answer any questions that you have. So let's move to Dr. Marty and Chief De La Rosa. Welcome everyone. It's an Not honor really. and a privilege to be here with all of you. Um, I'm here to answer questions about the COVID-19 vaccine, any kinds of questions that you are interested in, and, uh, and to give you any um, assurances that I can about what is safe, what is not safe, and also to answer any other medical questions, including questions about the variants. Chief Hillary. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for, to Commissioner Keon for inviting me and allowing me to chat with all of you today. Um, I will be discussing with you what our city plan is uh, now and going forward with regards to vaccines. And as well as uh, Dr. Marty just stated, I'll be available to answer any of your questions. Good evening to everyone. Okay, Dr. Marty, do you wanna start? I think we need to put into perspective where we are. I think it's important that we realize how, how much things have changed in just one year. Um, just at the end of January last year, uh, there were less than 8,000 cases of COVID-19 in the world, uh, less than 84 uh, outside of China. And, um, and, and already it was clear to public health that this was going to be a grave problem. And that's why the World Health Organization declared it back on the 30th of January, a public health emergency of international concern. So we've gone from less than 8,000 cases in the world to um, 104,248,610 as of today with more than 2,263,792 dead um, that we know of. This has been a devastating disease. And if we take it home to Miami-Dade, sadly, Miami-Dade has one of the highest rates in the United States of per 100,000. In fact, of all the counties, of the thousands of different counties that exist in the United States, uh, Miami-Dade is number four the, uh, in the top four for having cases of COVID-19 and number seven in terms of deaths throughout the world. That's the bad news. What else is one more piece of bad news before I go on? And that is, um, unfortunately, way too many people have not followed the public health guidelines and not helped us get this thing under control. And because uh, the, this virus has continued to transmit and we haven't broken chains of transmission, in the world there now exists a number of stable variants that are more aggressive than the original strain that first circled the world. But we, the good news is we still can get a handle on this, number one. And the second piece of excellent news is that we have two, not one, but two vaccines that have uh, not just been given, but have earned emergency use authorization from the FDA. And we are in the process of vaccinating our community. Which are those vaccines, Dr. Marty? So uh, to be very clear, in the, in the United States, the two vaccines that have received EUA are the vaccine uh, actually created with help from the uh, NIH, and, and specifically NIAID at NIH. That is the Moderna vaccine that's being produced by Moderna. The other vaccine that has received approval in the United States is from BioNTech, which is a German company uh, that paired with Pfizer. And so 
we're, we're in, in shorthand calling them the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. These uh, vaccines are, have, um, had, have undergone clinical trials, in fact, uh, all the way to uh, level three clinical trials and shown that they can produce 95% efficacy for the Pfizer vaccine and 94.1% efficacy for the Moderna vaccine against the original strain of COVID-19. Um, there are some issues with a couple of the new variants, specifically the South African variant seems to lessen the value of the vaccines, but they are still effective. They're still, you're still better off having had those vaccines than not, even if you're confronted with the South African variant. And unfortunately, that's also true of the Brazil variant. Okay, Chief Delarosa, do we wanna, are we ready to start um, taking some questions from, from our participants? Sure, I'd just like to, before we do that, if you don't mind, I'd just like to bring everybody up to speed as to where the city is with regards to uh, vaccination plans. Um, we'll start from the beginning. As uh, soon as the guidelines for uh, registering and being approved as a vaccination site were uh, communicated, we applied and received that authorization to become a community vaccination site. Um, we've submitted our plan to Department of Health as well as Miami-Dade County Emergency Management on how we would be ready to deliver vaccinations to our residents. Um, that plan includes all facets that we could do, whether it be at a fixed location that you walk up to, uh, uh, those that are homebound and unable to go to a site. And we also included in our plan large facilities such as a residential building with high demographics of those that are in the target area or um, faith-based uh, like churches or synagogues. Um, it's important to note that our plan is uh, part of an overall county and then state plan, which may be implemented in whole or in part. Any actions that we're gonna take, we're gonna make sure that our actions are consistent with the Miami-Dade County uh, Department of Health and Office of Emergency Management, as well as the state and CDC guidelines. A, um, we have, it's important to note that our plan is not a one size fits all. So our goal through emergency management is to facilitate any and all means for you to access an appointment and a vaccination. So we have a plan, but I don't want you to believe that that is the only reliant method that you have to receive a, a vaccine. We're working with our community health partners to increase access to a reservation through them. We're working with our county partners to try to enhance access to you for vaccination. So. We're really looking at every means possible for you to be able to access an appointment or a reservation for vaccines. Not just, we're not just looking internally to just our city, but whatever resources are in our community, we are looking to uh, gain access to it or enhance our access to it. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a multi-prong approach that includes you know, city managed sites, state and county facilities, or uh, community health partners. Um, we're using every means possible to communicate with you. Um, if you go to our website, on the top of our city website, coralgables.com, there's a banner. When you hit that banner, it is, our goal is to create a central portal of information for you. So for instance, if you go to that website right now, there is a website that you can register right now with the state of Florida for a appointment for vaccine. And they will get back to you when they have vaccines and an appointment available in Miami-Dade County. There is access to Jackson Health. There's access to Miami-Dade County. 
So any place that would have a website for someone to access and be able to uh, request an appointment, we've centralized it in our website. In addition to that, um, we keep communicating our hotline number that you can call and receive information, or we can provide assistance for you if you do not have access or you're not um, uh, tech savvy. You can always talk to a person on the phone and we can assist you or direct you onto that. So all of that information is in one place. If you access Miami-Dade's website, it, you'll find the same information uh, and, and the same with us. We're trying to centralize everything into one location. So as you are searching for um, a, a site that has vaccines and may have appointments available, as soon as we learn of that, we put it in one centralized location for you. So what are our current challenges? Our current challenges are the same challenges that our nation is having and all communities are having. Right now, demand outpaces our supply. Um, it's not an issue of means. It's not an issue of the city not communicating or requesting or accessing uh, supply. Uh, we're doing that on a constant basis. We are participating in every community meeting that we can to learn of either new sites or what will be upcoming with access to vaccines or opportunities to access appointments for our community. So we are not leaving a stone unturned with regards to providing access to our residents to uh, their opportunity to be vaccinated. But as I stated earlier, and as Dr. Marty stated before, uh, demand is currently outpacing supply. And that's, that's our biggest challenge as, uh, as we meet this evening. Thank you, Chief De La Rosa. So our biggest issue is, is just being able to get the vaccine. That's right, we have a plan in place. We have the people to do it. We just haven't received the vaccine and we're hoping to do that. One of the things while we're waiting for people to have questions, um, I really would like to encourage you to stay in touch with or write to our state leaders, your state senators, your state Congress people, and, and tell them how necessary it is to, to send Miami-Dade County a proportionate share of that vaccine. We are not getting a proportionate share based on the number of cases um, that we have. And we need, we need them to listen to both us as elected leaders, but they, we need them to listen to you too as residents of the state of Florida to ask them to send Miami-Dade County the proportionate share of vaccines that we need because it is all distributed through the state. So Billy, do we have any questions? May I make a comment? Yes. So I think that they, the community should know that Florida was given uh, 3,658,975 doses so far of the vaccine and it has distributed 58% uh, distributed of that. So um, it, it's just a little bit more than half has been distributed and so far, we've covered 8.2% of our population with one dose of the vaccine and only 1.7% of the Florida population has received two doses so far. And I, I, so, I so endorse what uh, Commissioner Cohen -Kian just said. It is imperative that you speak to your representatives. Um, Florida needs more vaccines, but Miami-Dade in particular is not getting its proportion of vaccine based on our population of elderly uh, or um, on the fact that we are the highest risk county for COVID-19. And we've had a disproportionate amount of disease at, uh, for people of all ages, including children. Thank you. So we ask you, please, Get in touch with your with our lawmakers and and at both the state and the federal level, and and talk to them about the distribution of vaccine here to us locally here in Miami Dade County. Dr. Marty, I've had some questions that people ask and raise concern about um, the effect of vaccine on 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 women who uh, may still 
to have children and has there been any discussion or any talk about about this on the effect of the vaccine on fertility? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, that's a really important question. Uh, when the clinical trials were done for both Pfizer and Moderna, neither uh, of them included pregnant women. And in fact, they didn't want their women to be pregnant. They all signed documents and promised to practice birth control in one form or another. However, people being people, during the trial, several women in both groups became pregnant. And so we're following those individuals very carefully. And so far, no untoed effects have been found uh, in those women that couldn't be explained for other reasons that, that uh, you know, because things happen anyway. Um, and moreover, among the people that have been vaccinated in the United States, uh, more than 15,000 uh, pregnant women have taken the vaccine. These are mostly healthcare providers and have registered in VIRS, which is the program that we really urge anyone who gets the vaccine to please sign on to. Uh, VIRS is a special Center for Disease Control program that sends you text messages uh, asking you, how are you doing? Do you have any symptoms? Have you, have you gotten infected with COVID? They want, to, they want to do this assessment. This is part of what we call the phase four trial, right? We've done a phase three trial and by getting this information. So they're looking at these 15,000 pregnant women who have already signed up for this. And again, we, we were just this weekend reviewing the data from the VIRS. And as of now, once again, we're not seeing any significant problems in pregnant women. There was a concern and a discussion at the national level, at the National Advisory Council for Vaccines, uh, in which I participated in. And in that conversation, we reviewed the risk benefit ratio for pregnant women. Um, we ha everyone needs to understand that COVID-19 is, is a higher risk if you are pregnant. Pregnant women who get COVID-19 are more likely to end up in the hospital and more likely to have problems. And we have seen, although thank goodness, very few, but we have seen problems to the offspring. So the, the upshot is that when you compare the risk of getting COVID and you're pregnant versus the risk, which so far haven't been actually found from taking the vaccine uh, while you're pregnant, we are advising pregnant women that it, that it is, a, if they have a high exposure to COVID for whatever reason, so if you're sitting around at home and working from home, that's different. But if you are a frontline worker and you're pregnant, then you're better off getting the, the, uh, the vaccine. Thank you. If anyone has questions for Dr. Marty or Chief Delarosa, at the top of your screen, there is a button that says more if you're on an iPad. If you press that button, you can either raise your hand or you can write into the chat. But if you raise your hand, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Dr. Marty, can you, can you talk to us a little bit about the, um, the plan at the federal level to address the need for for vaccines um, that is that is currently being discussed. So there are two plans now. There is the plan proposed by the Biden administration, uh, which has funding for not just the vaccine for uh, for also um, implementing the um, Defense Production Act to get more of these high quality vaccines made. Uh, in many other ways so that, so that there's more to distribute uh, and also has, the, has funding for the wherewithal that you need because you, you don't need just the vial, you need the needles. I mean, you need, excuse me, you need, you need the syringes, you need the, you, you need the band-aids, you need the, 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 the people, you need to distribute it, you need the cold storage, all these things are included in the, in the bill that was proposed by the Biden administration. The, there were 10 Republicans who had a, a very uh, productive meeting 
with uh, President Biden, and they also uh, want to fund that aspect. So I'm, I'm very, I'm hoping that you, everyone can write to their congressmen and urge them to assure that they can, in a bipartisan way, uh, come up with a solution that assures rapidly having sufficient vaccine for everyone in the United States as soon as possible. Uh, and really, uh, one of the wonderful things that our new president has done is he rejoined the World Health Organization and committed to COVAX. Um, that may not sound great uh, at first, but if you realize that every human being, and especially here in Miami-Dade, where we have so much of our economy is based on tourism, we really do want the rest of the world vaccinated because vaccinating ourselves alone doesn't solve the problem. Uh, when we travel and when others travel here, we can restart a problem, and especially in countries that are prone to make variants that can then come back and defeat the, the what me, whatever measures we have developed. Thank you. We have a question from a resident asking, once you have the two shots of the Pfizer vaccine and wait two weeks, can you get the virus and pass it to someone else in your household that is not vaccinated yet? So uh, in the phase three trial, they did not test people who did not have symptoms of COVID. And that's why you heard on the news that we do not know uh, what percentage of people who are fully vaccinated can, can acquire the virus and then produce enough virus to share it with someone else. However, very recently, AstraZeneca did a, a study on that for, the, uh, for their vaccine. And uh, they found that those people who were vaccinated had a reduced rate of being able to transmit the infection when they were asymptomatic. So the, the upshot is, I'm, I, I'm not trying to be vague, it's just that it's a little bit complicated. And that is that, yes, you can still transmit the, the infection if you have been fully vaccinated, but it's very likely, very likely that you are not going to produce a high viral load. And that's really important because the think about it as any invaders coming against you. If you've got, you know, two people knocking on your door, uh, you might be able to manage it. If you've got a mob of, you know, 30,000, uh, then you're overwhelmed, right? So the same thing when it comes to little microscopic organisms, if you have a much lower viral load, that's less likely to cause disease in other people. Uh, we have, I'm sorry, we have another question here. Why does the new J&J &J vaccine state 3%? Why not the same as Moderna and Pfizer? You're asking about 3%? What, what do yes, you they, there's a question from, from someone that asked, why does the new J Johnson & Johnson vaccine state 3%? Why not the, not the same for the Moderna and Pfizer? Um, I don't know what the, what is the efficacy rate so of the J&J? Actually, J&J uh, &J has not come out with its full data yet, but uh, from early uh, review of what we have available, it, it does not give you 95% efficacy um, or 94% efficacy, it, and not, nor does Sputnik, nor does the Chinese vaccine, nor does AstraZeneca. Most of the other, vac the non-mRNA vaccines don't reach that level of efficacy. Um, what, what, what people need to understand is there, we have many different vaccine platforms in the world. There are 175 vaccine platforms that are being studied and another 63 that are under clinical trial. Uh, and just a handful have been approved in the world. And of the handful that have been approved, um, be, what, I, what I mean by platforms is, what is the basis that, that the substance that's being injected, how does it work to actually give you protection? And the, the different platforms include you already know about messenger RNA. I can give you more detail on that if you want. 
or you can have a vectored vaccine. So the J&J &J vaccine is one of the vectored vaccines. And what does that mean? That means they take another virus, one that's not serious, and they add to the virus's genetic makeup the ability for that virus to show on its surface a little tiny spike that belongs to the SARS-2 virus. So when your body sees that vectored virus, it also sees one of the nastiest parts of the SARS-2 virus and starts to produce antibodies to that, but it also produces antibodies to the original virus. And one of the problems with many of these vectored vaccines is which is, what vector have they used? So one of the problems with the Chinese vaccine is they used a vector of a, of a particular virus that causes the common cold. And so when they tested it against people who had had that common cold, their vaccine did not work. Um, the, but there, this becomes really, really complicated if you look at all the different platforms that are being used. One of the beauties about the messenger RNA vaccines is that because it's just a string of code wrapped in a little lipid blanket, um, Moderna and Pfizer are already very, in very short time can adapt that code, can change it to capture some of the variants. The, these other vaccines that use other platforms that are either inactivated vaccines, you've probably heard about one of the Chinese vaccines that has an abysmal record. It, it had a 51% efficacy in Brazil is a killed vaccine. So it's basically, they give you an inactivated form of SARS-2. That doesn't seem to work very well. Um, the, and these vectored vaccines are also complicated to change. The messenger RNA vaccines are pretty easy to change. So we're very fortunate in the United States to have the two best possible platforms approved and ready for use. Thank you. Um, Chief Delarosa, um, do you have anything that you would like to add? I was just gonna ask Dr. Marty, some of the questions that we field um, with uh, regards to the vaccine, is there some skepticism to the speed in which the vaccine was developed and came out um, and is available for use with, in contrast to uh, other vaccines, whether it be the flu vaccine or not. And I was just wondering if uh, you can offer the group uh, some brief insight as to how the, or the technology that went behind using messenger RNA for this vaccine. Thank you, Chief De La Rosa. That is a, that's one of my favorite questions. Uh, and the reason is that um, this is, some, this is a, an area of research that I've been interested in for many, many years. In fact, the idea to create messenger RNA vaccines started in 1989. This is not something that we just dreamed up in 2020. Uh, and so many researchers throughout the world have been working for decades, literally for decades, trying to figure out how to provide messenger RNA vaccines. And many studies have been done with messenger RNA vaccines for use because they're actually very applicable to treating cancer. Um, so a lot of the technology was developed for that. The Moderna vaccine in particular is, is very fascinating because when Zika happened, and MERS happened. So though MERS is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It's a, it's a kissing cousin of our horrible COVID-19 SARS-2 virus. Um, it start, it, we recognized it in the world in 2012. There were researchers who got funding for working on MERS vaccines and working on Zika. And that funding was used to realize something really interesting that could be done with messenger RNA. So in uh, 2017, the N NIH, NIAID, figured out to add two little amino acids. So by, so in effect to the nucleic acids, the nucleic acids, you add them and then you get the nucle the, these two amino acids. And what those do is that this spike protein in nature is sort of swirling around and keeps changing shape. 
by adding those two amino acids, it fixes it in just the right shape so that when your immune system sees the spike that's produced from the messenger RNA, it's very immunogenic and it's, it's the kind of experience that the immune system needs in order to produce the right and the most neutralizing antibodies and the best type of cells to combat COVID-19. So it's not a new technology. The patent for doing this was already developed for a different um, a beta coronavirus, which is the MERS virus, which also has a spike. All they had to do, knowing what to do, was change the code so it met the genetics of this new virus. Does that answer your question? Or was that too much? No, I, I think it's just important for people to note that uh, what you stated earlier, that this was not something that was developed throughout this year as our country faced the COVID challenge, but really it was just um, old technology, as you stated, that has been adapted to, to, vac to this vac vaccine. There has been a revolution, Chief, in uh, immunology and in molecular biology over the last 40 years. Uh, we are, are not, when I started medical school in the 70s, because yes, I'm that old, um, our knowledge of immunology was so primitive compared to now. The, the money that was poured in to research the problem that we had with AIDS, with HIV, was incredibly beneficial towards understanding the immune system in general and has led to the production of anti-cancer drugs, has led to the production of, of drugs for autoimmune diseases, has led to new ways of making vaccines. And then uh, with, with the discovery of CRISPR that happened in the, uh, in the 2000s as, as a big deal, and really 2011, two women just got the Nobel Prize for that, by the way, our knowledge of molecular biology just went through the roof. And all of this that has been happening over time has given us the tools to much more readily produce these very, very uh, effective vaccines that are much safer than the vaccines that we had years ago because they're very targeted to solving a particular problem. Thank you. Um our economic development director, Julian Perez, is on the, on the line and or is on with us and would like to uh, speak for a moment. Julian? Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marty. Um, basically, you answered my question and it had to do with the J&J &J, uh, vaccine and, um, and the fact that the phase three of the J&J &J, um, was done in the, United, in the United States, South America, and South Africa. And, um, and when it was done in South Africa, the variant now there, um, do you think that once we get the final results uh, from all of that uh, phase three work that they did in South Africa, that we may have uh, uh, something here that may help us out with the variant? And that's number one. And number two, do you think that they're going to get their um, e EUA uh, this month or early next month? Well, I know they want to. Um, yeah. You know, we, that was a discussion that we had this weekend as well as to um, what, it, what is the, the balance of value, right? Uh, if you have some of these vaccines, some of these chimeric vaccines, such as the J&J, &J, which don't reach the same level of efficacy as the messenger RNA vaccines, right. are still effective. And so the question is, um, are we knocking out enough serious disease, right? Because ultimately, it's the people who are hospitalized, the people who are in the ICUs, and the people who die that are driving the problem, right? Um, and they're driving the problem in the sense of what it, how it affects the economy and how it affects our behavior. They're not the ones that are necessarily spreading the virus. If we can, re if we can get another vaccine online that helps reduce the amount of hospitalizations, that would have a good effect on the economy. But then on the flip side, the question is, 
uh, given an option, do you want a vaccine that gives you a 95% risk of, uh, of not having uh, sickness from this virus? Or, do you, or would, are you perfectly fine taking one that's 70% effective at keeping you? In other words, you still have a 30% chance of coming down with the disease. And that's the, that's the other, that's the dilemma. Are, is, is it morally correct to approve a vaccine that doesn't meet the same efficacy and, and safety standard? Thank you. Thank you. So it's really important you know, from Julian as our economic development director is to get our businesses back up and running and, and get people back to work, get teachers back in the classroom is that you know, we, again, we try and get our fair share of, of the vaccine, but also Dr. Marty, what are the other things that we just have to do while we're waiting? I think it's very important that everyone understands that um, we have to break the chain of transmission. And I, I, I keep saying it, and I'm not sure that people understand how critical it is. Every single time that the virus has an opportunity to go from person A to person B and replicate. Every time it replicates, it can change. And as it changes, it gets ahead of us. And that's what's happening with these variants. These are now, a, each, of, each of the different variants has a stable set of mutations that gives an advantage to the virus. Look what's happening in Manaus. In Manaus, uh, they had a horrific outbreak of COVID in the very beginning of the pandemic, where 70% of their population were, was infected and ill from the original strain. Now they're facing the Brazil strain, and those people who had COVID before are getting sick again because the virus has mutated and has taken advantage of not having the chains of transmission broken and 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 they're behind the eight ball we're behind the eight ball the brazil variant is already in the united states it hasn't been identified in florida yet but that's really just a matter of time i think it's important that the government the federal government has taken the action of asking people who come to uh, the united states to prove that they are COVID negative Unfortunately, the enforcement on that is pretty poor. Uh, some individuals who uh, you know, have a, a negative antibody test are, are using that as, as evidence that they don't have COVID. That's not a valid test at all to say whether someone does or doesn't have COVID. In fact, just the opposite. It could very well mean that they have COVID. Um, that, so we need to tighten that up. And number two, since both the South, since all three, the UK variant is definitely in Florida. The Brazil variant is definitely in the United States. We have two different states reporting community spread of the South African variant, and we have no control. We, we don't have that imposition of show us a negative COVID before you board a flight from um, New York to Miami. So the, the we have to be vigilant and we have to do everything we can to break the chains of transmission. The same things you've been hearing over and over, wear the mask, keep the distance, wash the hands, avoid crowded places and indoor spaces. Um, Dr. Marty, we have a question here. When you say that Miami-Dade is not getting proportionate vaccines, is the central government allocating to each countries, or is the governor's office deciding on the amount of vaccine for each county? That is entirely at the discretion of Tallahassee. The, the federal government, uh, because of the way our constitution works, where the ninth and 10th amendment give rights to the states and the individuals that are not part of the federal government, health, unfortunately, the, the founding fathers didn't uh, put it as something that belonged to the federal government. So it belongs to the states and the federal government allocates to the states, then the governor further uh, does the allocations as it wishes. And, it, and as you know, each state has set different priorities. Uh, some states are vaccinating only people above 75, even though the federal government has requested that all states vaccinate at 65 and above. Some states, many states are vaccinating teachers already. I wish we were vaccinating teachers. I think that would be very important, but that wasn't the decision of Tallahassee. And the amount of vaccine coming to Miami-Dade, 
uh, as opposed to Broward or any other county in, in Florida is, is entirely at the discretion of the governor. Thank you. So it really isn't the federal government. They just make it available to the state by request. And then the state is the one that distributes the vaccine to the counties. And the state of Florida is one of the states of the United States that has received uh, one of the highest amounts of vaccine available. So we, we have been allocated a lot of vaccines. Uh, only states like California have received more. Um, so we have a follow-up. Um, so it's the governor's office is doing the disproportionate allocation and not the federal government. So you're saying yes, it is coming through the state capital that is making those decisions is through the governor's office. Yeah, yes. so write to your governor and say- Write to the governor, write to the, our lawmakers, ask that Miami-Dade get its proportionate share of the vaccines based on the population of the elderly population that we have here in Florida, yes. Um, we have a, a question from uh, one of our city employees asking if Coral Gables employees will get the vaccine soon or have to look someplace else. Um, Chief Delarosa, do you want to answer that? So uh, we have followed the CDC guidelines. So uh, we offered the vaccine to our first responders, our paramedics that have direct patient care and are going into folks home to uh, assist them in a medical emergency. And then uh, we discussed it with and, uh, and sought approval. And once we opened up, uh, we used some of the remaining vaccines and we targeted our employees that were over the age of 65, um, especially any and all employees that had uh, direct access to our public. So um, we have targeted our employees, but we had to stay within the guidelines of the CDC right now, which states that you have to be over 65. Um, our plan includes, as I stated earlier, um, the ability to do our employees. Um, we proved the infrastructure and the process uh, and the manner in which we vaccinated those employees as well as our first responders, our firefighters. So um, when we have the allocations to vaccines and uh, that demographic uh, or the guidelines from the state increase to us being able to do um, essential employees that do not have direct health care providers uh, we will certainly do that. Thank you. I, I have a message that someone has their hand raised. Can we unmute them and let them let them speak? Yeah, hello. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi. Are you accepting contributions from developers? I'm sorry, we're talking about COVID. Can I help no, you? No, I'm talking about Okay, I think you're, you're off here, off the, uh, off the question here. Um, Dr. Marty, so with regard to the variants that are, that are there, can we do, do the same precautions of hand washing and wearing masks? Um, does that still apply? That's still our most effective way of dealing with this? There's no question that um... These viruses, these SARS-CoV-2 viruses are spread by mainly breathing them in, right? So anything we do uh, that prevents us breathing them in um, is going to help. And, and, it, and it's going to help regardless of whether it's the new variant or an old variant. The, that is the most effective thing. Yes, we can also put them into our, um, into our mucous membranes from dirty hands. That's why we ask people to wash their hands. Yes, uh, if it's a very concentrated amount of virus in a room, uh, it's, it's theoretically possible and has been shown in the lab that some people can get it through their eyes. That's why we sometimes in, in certain situations recommend shield and mask uh, to protect from that source. Um, so, uh, and if you, if you weigh in the fact of how these aerosols accumulate over time in a room, you understand that um, it is very important to stay away from 
being in a crowded room with people who are not part of your bubble because that's going to increase your risk of being exposed. Some um, researchers are now recommending double masking if, you, if your community is known to have some of these uh, more dangerous variants. The UK variant, we're still trying to determine exactly how much more dangerous it is when a, someone is, it has it. We do know there's been uh, cases, quite a number of cases now in Miami data, the UK variant, and the UK variant is increasing in Florida. There's no question about that. Um, it, um, the good news about the UK variant is that the vaccine seems to work, both the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna seem to work very well against the UK variant. Um, it's the South African and the Brazil that aren't getting that same level of efficacy. And by the way, we were in the conference call I was in this weekend, we talked about the monoclonal antibodies, um, such as what the previous president received when he got COVID. And those monoclonal antibodies have really been lifesavers for our patients. And now there's data that both the South African and the Brazil variants aren't responding to the, the monoclonal antibodies like the original strains. So yes, we're working on making new monoclonal antibodies, but the best thing we can all do is break the chains of transmission so we can stay ahead of the virus and we don't have to make new vaccines and new uh, monoclonal antibodies and new products. Thank you. We have another question as a follow-up from Ashok. For the more vir virulent and contagious viruses, would you recommend using N95 uh, masks instead of the cloth and surgical masks? Or are the surgical masks that we see still providing that protection? Right. So the uh, OSHA actually classifies the N95s as respirators. And they are more effective at uh, keeping you safe. They're also, having worn them a lot in the hospital, I can tell you they're very uncomfortable if you are wearing them properly. And that unfortunately doesn't always happen. Um, when the general public buys an N95 respirator, they, they don't know what size to buy, they don't get fit tested, and, they don't, uh, and they're not receiving the instructions as to how that mask needs to be worn for maximum effect. So yes, the N95 masks are better than regular surgical masks and better than uh, just a cloth mask, but you would have to know how to use it and be fit tested. Yeah, they don't often come with, we seem to order them online or get them someplace, but they don't come with any instructions. So, you know, you see people with them, you know, still, they're not tight against your face or whatever else. So as effective as they may be, they're not being worn in a way that would make them as effective as they could be. So you need to be careful with how they're worn. Yeah, it, it's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. I, it, it, it distresses me how often I see people wearing a mask with their nose showing. <laughs> Don't you understand that's, that's the main way in which you're gonna be infected is by breathing in this virus? Please cover your nose. Well, thank you very much. So I think the message or our takeaway tonight is that um, we are still, there's COVID still in, in, within the community. It's still contagious. Um, there are variants that are, are now becoming apparent and we need to continue to be as cautious as we have been since last March. We need to continue to wear a mask. Um, we know that we cannot find people for not wearing masks. So we know that this is a matter of just compliance and the community caring for itself and a community caring for one another. If you care about your neighbor, if you care about your parent, if you care about your child, wear that mask. Wear it when you go out, wear the mask. Commissioner, if I may, yes. if I may, um... It's counterproductive not to wear the mask if your concern is the economy. The best way to be able to have a functioning opening economy in the middle of a pandemic like this one is for everyone to be properly wearing their masks. That's gonna facilitate doing business. So one of the, so I actually have no, there is no science and there's no logic 
to not enforcing the mask orders. And I think that's something else people ought to be sending letters to, uh, to the governor about. That in fact, it, particularly here where we're such a tourist economy, um, there's so many people that are not part of our, that are not our residents that may not be wearing the mask properly and putting all of us at risk. So um, it's really not a hardship to ask people to do just, I understand that sometimes a mask can be uncomfortable and I, there are tricks and ways to make them more comfortable. There's, uh, there's these lipstick protectors that you can purchase online that they're called lipstick protectors, but they actually give you a little bit of a brace inside so that you can breathe very comfortably underneath the mask. Uh, I assure you, I use those all the time, whether I have an N95 or a cloth mask or set of masks on. Okay, thank you. So I don't think we have any more questions. And do you have any, Chief De La Rosa? Do you have anything else you would like to talk about before we say good evening? Just uh, thank you for having us on. I appreciate the opportunity to um, have our department and our emergency management staff uh, present to you and tell you where we're at and what we're continuing to work on. Uh, Thank you to Dr. Marty. Uh, she was very educational today and she's been very uh, educational throughout this whole process and other meetings that we are in at the same time. And I think she's been instrumental in leading our community through this. So I thank her as well. Uh, and thanks for everybody that joined us today and, and received this information and, and made us better by asking great questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marty. We do have one more question and someone, they are asking um, how long the immunity from the vaccine will last. Wow, that's the million dollar question. Um, so we're actually doing some studies at FIU and many other places are doing these types of, of, of research. We're looking at the, what kinds of cells, whether we're producing enough memory cells to get a clue ahead of time. And what our preliminary data is indicating is that people who are vaccinating are producing the types of cells that typically lead to at least a year or more of protection. But the truth remains that the proof is in the pudding. Um, we, the only way we'll really know how long the protection lasts is once people have had the vaccine for that length of time and you have enough people that have had it for a year, enough people that have had it for two years to be able to do those, those studies. And then there's the second complication of, again, if we're not being careful and we allow the, the transmission to be carried forth and more variants form, then even if you did have great immunity to whatever we originally produced the vaccine for, um, we have a problem and we'll have to give you a booster with whatever is, is causing the problem in a new variant. And that's unfortunately the reality. So uh, we'll wait and see. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Marty. You are a tremendous resource in our community and you are always so generous with your time um, and your availability. I cannot thank you enough for all that you do for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Marty. Thank you, Chief Delarosa. Thank you to our city staff for, um, for hosting this with me tonight. Thank you and to everyone. Write to the governor, write to your legislators, support the funding um, for this vaccine and the distribution to the state. Please encourage the state to vaccinate our teachers so children can go back to school. Wear your mask, wash your hands, care for your neighbor so that we can open up, we are safe and our economy gets better. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night, thank you.